So good afternoon, everybody. I can see you all filing in there um, at the bottom of the screen. You're all very welcome. Um, my name is Steve France. I am the manager of Thrive Wellbeing Hub. Um, and you're all very welcome along today to our webinar. Um, Jennifer D will be coming on in a second. Um, and just before I hand over, I want to give a little intro. Jennifer O'D uh, delivered um, a really impactful, um, very popular session with us back in June of 21, um, which got an awful lot of engagement. We totally ran out of time for our Q&A, so we're going to certainly allow that at the end of this session today. Um, Jennifer, as some of you may know, you might have seen that first session, um, is a trained actress, first and foremost, uh, working in the arts for 20 odd years um, on the stage and in film and all that good stuff and as a writer as well. Um, so she's a good wordsmith. Um, so uh, Jennifer has moved into executive coaching and leadership coaching um, recently, fairly recently in the last kind of five, five to 10 years and is uh, delivering impactful training sessions using role play and her knowledge of the sort of the stage and her presence and all that good stuff um, and sort of delivers those to uh, lots of business in Ireland um, and globally as well. So we're really, really delighted to have Jennifer back with us um, to deliver this communicating with impact. So I think as we navigate back into the office spaces and um, instead of communicating maybe with screens and in our slippers, we have to now don the suits and um, the office wear and get back into the office and um, improve those skills and maybe relearn some of them and of course learn something new. So without further ado, Jennifer, um, you're very welcome. Um, I'll leave it over to you and um, I'll come back to you at the end. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dee. Gosh, it's always really hard to live up to those intros. <laughs> But look, I'm absolutely delighted to be with you again, and many thanks to you, Dee, and to Chartered Accountants for inviting me back. Um, so I'm going to talk today about communicating with impact. Um, you already heard my background there. I am an executive coach, a corporate role player, and um, an actress. So when I was looking into this webinar and thinking about what I might do, I started to do a little bit of research around this area. And I came across a report from Indeed.com. In 2020, Indeed.com did a report where they, they studied Silicon Valley and they looked to see what was the top in-demand skill that businesses in Silicon Valley were looking for when in their recruiting process. And no surprises, no prizes going to the answer, but the number one skill was communications. Communication skills is what they were looking for for the people that they wanted to hire. So I thought this was a really interesting fact because you're going to the center of business, the center of technical expertise, the, the, the forefront of this new industrial revolution, the digital revolution, and what are they looking for? They're not looking for tech savvy people as their number one priority. And they understand and they understood in 2020 that tech skills can be taught. And that's what you do when you go to university. And that's what you do when you join a firm or an organization. They teach you the tech and they teach you how to do it. But the selling, uh, the, the teaching of those softer skills is a much more difficult sell, if you like. And, and, and that's what people are looking for. Because in this world that we're in, now in this whole new path, the navigating this, this new world, people buy people, if you like. So communication skills are the absolute, the golden ticket in order to get on in this world that we're in. So I just thought it was a really interesting place to start today. Um, and it kind of, uh, it, it consolidates the, the world that I'm in and the, 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 what I feel passionately about. So I was really pleased <laughs> to read that. So what am I gonna talk about today? Okay. Look, the obvious things like, you know, how to maximize your presence on this little small box that we all live in these days. So, yeah, we'll start there. I'm going to talk about connecting to a group and to in a one to one. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about storytelling, about listening, about being present. And I'm going to finish up with some tips. What can we learn from the theater? Um, and, and that's where my passion is. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share that little bit of that with you. Okay, let's go for the low hanging fruit. So basic tech tips about how to come across well on screen. Okay, the very first thing I'm going to say is also going to be the very last thing I say and what I say in the middle. 
And that is when you are preparing to start communicating with somebody or to start talking to a whole group or to make a presentation like this, like I'm doing today. The first thing that you should be doing is that you should be thinking about them, about the other person in this relationship. You need to take the pressure and the focus off yourself. How am I performing? How am I going to do this? What am I going to say? And it's got to be much more about what are they receiving from me and how am I coming across to them? So that's where I'm going to start here. And, and, and let's start with this little square, as I said, that we're in. The very first thing you need to do is you need to center yourself properly in the screen. Now, I have to say, two years down the line from this big pivot that we all did in the world to, to working, you know, in face to face, uh, to, to working from our box rooms and our bedrooms and all the rest of it. I'm amazed at how people are still, you know, turning up on screen. Like I regularly go into sessions and people are like this and people are like that and people are like this. And I, I always I, I always want to say, um, are, you, are you aware? I, I, I just I just find it really surprising that uh, people don't realize that expectations have changed. We're not in that sort of survive stage where, you know, it's just great to be able to see anybody at all. People are much more um, discerning now. Uh, they expect a lot more from you. They expect you to present well. They expect you to be lit well. They expect your audio to be good. The, the expectations are out there and they're set. So you need to live up to those if you want to be impactful. So where is your light source coming from, for example? Or if you have the window behind you, it's absolutely blinding for me if I'm on the other side of that. Also, it removes all the features from your face. I can't see your eyes. I can't see your, you know, your, the little micro systems that are at play all the time in, in our faces when we are, we have the luxury of that face-to-face -face interaction. They're all gone if it's completely, you know, you're putting yourself in shade. Um, so nice to have a, a source of light coming from one side. If you need to enhance that, that's my little trick here, a little ring light I'd have in, in, you know, in the afternoons to, to balance out that light. Again, it's for you to make sure that you can see me. It's not particularly nice for me to have that light going on, but I know it's better for you. Your audio, how's your audio? These little, what I call the pilot sets, they're terrific and they give us a great freedom around being able to move our hands but there, you know, you've got to be careful with that mic. If it's right here in your lips, it can be absolutely booming for us to hear those plosives coming out, the P's and the B's and the sibilant S's. Every time you hit that, I'm like wincing. Imagine being in a meeting for an hour long with that. So check it out. Think of me. Think of how I'm receiving you. Check in with your team. How's my sound? How do I look? How's my, how's my light? All that sort of thing. Um, the big one. This is my personal favorite. Hi, it's great to see you. I'm really glad that we've had this chance to connect and I've got really important things to say to you. Where are you looking? How, are you working from two screens? If you're working from two screens, where's your camera? Take a minute to identify it. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's okay to, to, you know, glance down at your screen and to, you know, to look at the faces. But bearing in mind, remember what I said, how are they receiving you? It's much better for you if I'm looking into the camera than if I'm looking into the screen or looking at my figures and all of that. So just remember that. What's going on for them? How am I coming across? So that's it. That's a really good place to start. The other thing is in these meetings, if you're in a group with more than two people, there's always a tension around, you know, getting your point in, overlapping, all of that. That can be really stressful and it can really test the natures of people in the team, or you know, if you are um, meeting with even family, <laughs> I found it in my own. So be aware that um, you know it. it be, it's it, the onus is on the extroverts in the group to make sure they're not sucking up all the all the oxygen there, using up all the talk time. If you are naturally an extrovert, be aware of that. Be cognizant of the fact that there will be people in the in the group and in the room who haven't had an opportunity to speak, and. Um, if you're one of those people, make it your make it your mission to just hold back a little bit. I mean, the world needs extroverts, but sometimes the world needs extroverts to step back a little bit. Likewise, if you're an introvert, these places can be intimidating, can be even more difficult to get your message across. 
I would always say when I'm working with people who feel slightly more introverted and it's difficult to be heard sometimes in these environments, try to get in early in, in the conversation, even if it just means you're agreeing with somebody or even if it means you're, you're adding a piece of um, maybe a piece of evidence or you're, you're, you're backing up what somebody else has to say with some, some piece of information. It, it's really nice to just kind of what I call crack open your voice in that environment, you know, uh, and, and it means that you've spoken. There's a, I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote that, that I read a while ago to say, until you've spoken in a meeting, you haven't arrived. And I just thought that was a great little piece of advice. So force yourself to try to say something early on, even if it's just a little bit of rapport, you know, get your voice, crack it open there in the meeting. In general terms, it's nice to leave a little beat after you've spoken, just to, just to give that moment of opportunity for someone else to come in. All in all, it's just leading to a better atmosphere and you're coming across better, you're impacting better on the people around you. Okay, so how do you really make that communication impactful? Well, the key, to, the key to it all is connection. So only connect is the first thing that I would say. So, you know, think, think about, as I said before in the tech, think in a bigger picture, you know, what does my audience want to hear from me? What do they need to hear? Who are they? Who are my audience? Think about them. Again, you're taking the pressure off yourself. Um, uh, how do you want them to feel when you finish speaking? That's a really important part. You know, that famous quote that we all know, you know, people will forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. That's true for a big, big group as much as it is for, for a one-to-one. -one. So the, the big question here then is how do you connect? How do you connect with your audience? Well, you know, a very common one and a very successful one these days is storytelling. You know, people's stories are extremely effective at getting your message across and finding a shared experience. God knows COVID has been the biggest shared experience of our generation, unfortunately, and many generations before. And you'd have to go back to World War II before you find something as unifying in its awfulness as COVID. That's a shared experience that's going to help you build rapport with, with a group or with people. Everyone has a COVID story at this stage, God help us. Um, is there a relevant fact or a rele relevant figure? I started off today using that, that uh, figure, that quote from the Indeed report. I found that useful for me as a starting point for this. Um, don't be afraid to give a little bit of yourself, you know, when you're, when you're communicating and trying to connect with people. You know, as I said before, people buy people and businesses are just people talking to people. That's all they are. And if you, you know, if you like somebody personally, you're much more likely to go to them if you're buying or selling a product. Uh, so don't forget that part, you know, part of yourself. Can you bring humor into your interactions? You know, for me, that's one of my top values is humor. So, you know, I, I, that always comes with me wherever I go when I'm interacting with people. The other thing about stories and storytelling is, you know, stories connect with people much more than just facts. You know, like a, a story is likely to be remembered up to 22 times more than just raw facts, if you like. And, you know, stories are very, you know, beginning, middle and end. It's very satisfying for an audience. Things like the rule of three, can you tell things in threes? Again, very satisfying. That goes all the way back to Aristotle thousands of years ago, and it's still true today. Um, can you add in any of the senses, any of the five senses when you're telling a story? Again, it's more, it's just about creating a world that the person listening to you can relate to and feel themselves you know, sort of nodding along to. A little bit of health warning around how you deliver your stories. Um, like PowerPoint is fantastic. I've used it a lot. I use Mentimeter. I'm very fond of slides and I, I feel it's great. I have great belief in them. However, PowerPoint is 30 years old and the first recorded stories are 30,000 years old. If you think of like cave paintings in, in the middle of, you know, prehistoric eras. So don't get hung up on your PowerPoint. Stories were there a lot longer than slide decks and, you know, natty little illustrations. So broaden it out. Bear in mind, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So I'm going to tell you my story now, briefly. My story starts, uh, well, I'm starting my story when, uh, when I was 18, I left school and I joined the bank. And 
for me, it was a sort of just a random thing I ended up in. Um, and my very first day there, I was talking to one of the guys sitting opposite me and he said, I really want to be an actor. And that was my ambition. And that was totally hidden down. I'd been told in school that would never happen. I would never make that work. And he just said it straight out to me. And I was really astonished. And I said, I want to be an actor too. So we really laughed, the two of us, and we bonded that day. He went on about a year later, he applied for drama schools and he got accepted and he left the bank. And I was really thrilled about this. And I thought, I'm going to do the same. It's proven it, it can work. So about uh, another year later, I finally got everything, got my act together. I auditioned. I was in London. Excuse me. I auditioned for RADA and Landa and Centra and all those really exciting drama schools. And I was so excited to start my journey. One by one, the letters came in and I was rejected for every single school that I applied for. Honestly, I couldn't believe it. I was just totally demoralized. I was disappointed. I was bewildered because I thought, how do I get onto that path that I saw my friend do? That's now not possible for me. So it was a really low point when I, I just thought, I, I, I don't know how to move forward. Anyway, I decided the first thing to do would be to leave the bank. I did that. And I ended up going back to university. And of course, the first thing I did was hit drama society. And that was it. I suddenly, everything crystallized. I became much more focused about what I wanted to do. I got my degree and I applied again. And this time I applied to the Trinity course in Dublin, which is now the Lear. And I got accepted. And for me, the exhilaration, the excitement of that, and the absolute determination to focus on this was everything that I had possibly hoped and dreamed for. So I came home, did the course, left, and I started working as a professional actor. And it was fantastic. And I had the time of my life. I worked in the Abbey, the Gate, the Project, all of those places that you can think of. And I toured all over the country with different shows. It was wonderful. All great. By 10 years later, things began to slow down. I had kids. Uh, I was, you know, had, I was married. And the work slowed down a little bit. So my husband was, was working and that was fine. Suddenly we had a crisis in our house. My husband became completely unable to work and I very quickly had to be the breadwinner in the family. So within three weeks, I had done a training course and I started teaching English as a foreign language. Now I have to admit, I didn't love it. But what I did love was this interaction with learning and teaching and learning and groups of people and the whole training side of it. And that opened a new door to me. So then I got into training and then I thought, how can I marry these worlds together? My acting background and my teaching training uh, desires. And I put them together and I came up with corporate role play and ultimately executive coaching. And that is the journey that has brought me here sitting in front of this uh, camera today and talking to you uh, uh, in this, about this world. So that's my story. So. What am I doing here with that story? Well, the first thing I'm doing, to be honest, is I'm hoping to stir your interest. It's not a typical journey in the business world uh, today. I'm also I'm contextualizing myself. I'm credentializing myself. I've had a lot of experience. I know how to use my voice and my body, and I know how to interpret it in text, and I know how to deal with business people. I'm showing my USP with all of that acting side of my, of my life. And I feel that I'm showing you that my experience can help yours. So that's my story. Stories are not always biographical, if you like. Um, and a really good example of that, of course, is the famous iPhone launch that uh, Steve Jobs performed. And it was a performance in 2007. It was the ultimate theatrical event, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it, it lights up on, on Steve Jobs and he's, you know, he's on stage, he's wearing his characteristic black polo and jeans. He's thoughtfully walking across the stage and he, in a very low register, he says, this is a day that I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. And he goes on to talk about this revolutionary new product. He talks about a breakthrough communication platform, a, a state-of-the-art MP3, a brand new mobile phone, the rule of three again coming in there like that. You watch the first four minutes of that presentation 
it is a masterclass in storytelling. The audience are in the palm of his hand. They are in thrall. They're so excited. You cut it back to the audience. They're all like smiling. You swear they were at some kind of incredible musical or something. And that, that launch is studied in business schools all over the world as the opposite, the, the most excellent piece of storytelling for a product that has ever taken place. I, I would really recommend just, you know, it's about 20 minutes. You watch the first four minutes, you get the picture. You, you know, it, it's, it's bang on the money. So storytelling for data as well. Think about the, the results you get from, you know, Spotify at the end of the year or Fitbit. Uh, you know, you have climbed 72 sets of stairs this week. Uh, you have circumnav, I was told I'd circumnavigated the earth tw two and a half times one year. <laughs> Um, so, you know, think about an, a more um, creative and more interesting way to digest the information that you have to hand over from me to you. If you don't put some of yourself into it, then just send an email. Think of it that way. You know, how can you put yourself into this story? How can you make it interesting for me, the listener? And remember what I started with. It's about them. Make it more about them. And it takes the pressure off you and it makes it more interesting for them because you're addressing their needs and their desires. OK, so what about so that's kind of more group if you're talking to, to a group of people. What about one to one connecting and communicating with impact? Really important. And we're all about now to, to I presume a lot of us are going back, it may be hybrid or to some extent going back face to face and. I'll be honest, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about it. It's been a long time since I've stood up in front of, you know, IRL, as we say in real life, in front of a group of people. So I think there's going to be a bit of clumsy awkwardness with all of us as we learn to navigate this, you know, new, new world, if you like. <laughs> the new world is now the old world of the, of the uh, digital um, transformation. You know, now we're going to be back where we were. And there are challenges in that as well. So look, eye contact, look, that's obvious and it's a no brainer, but don't forget how important it is. And not just eye contact, you know, your face is the first thing that people are going to see. You know, your, your argument is next and your, you know, what you have to say comes after it. But the first thing you have to see is your face. So make it, make it a nice interaction, you know, use your smile, Use your, your energy, use what you have in front for that person to, to, to make it easy for them to say, hi, nice to meet you and nice to see you, whatever it is. Um, build rapport at the beginning. You know, there's no need to get straight down to business. And I mean, maybe in Ireland, sometimes it's the other way around. We tend to do, <laughs> it tends to be all rapport and then, you know, 10 minutes of business at the end. There's a lot to be said for that, um, particularly if, you know, you don't necessarily know that person terribly well. Spend some time at the beginning of, of the meeting. You know, you, you'll find that it will soften the atmosphere and it will make it easier then to get on to talk about what you actually have to talk about. So get, get the dialogue going. Um, asking open questions, of course, that's, uh, you know, an old one, but it's a good one all the same. Um, questions that don't have a yes or no answer, you know, questions beginning with how, questions beginning with what, they're all really useful for just getting everything going, opening up the conversation with the other person. I always like to talk about oxygen in the conversation. Allow the conversation to, to get some oxygen in there. In, instead of just a kind of a transactional mode of, you know, what did, did you do this? Did you do that? Have you done this? Yes, no, okay. You know, let's how are you getting on with the, this project? Or, you know, what's happening for you? Uh, tell me about, uh, you know, TED, TED Talks, they, they say, but TED is a really useful uh, little acronym to bear in mind. If you're wondering, you know, how am I going to fill this? Or how am I going to, what am I going to say to the person? Think of TED, the T in TED stands for tell me. So tell me about X, Y, or Z. Tell me about the family. That's a good one, isn't it, to start with. The E in TED is explain. Explain that to me. Can you explain that, how that's working? Or can you explain what, what's going on with X, Y, or Z? And D, describe, describe that for me. Can you describe where you are, blah, blah, blah. So TED is a really nice one just to have in the back of your mind. And it will, 
ensure that you're never just stuck waiting for, you know, I want to get in with my next question. It, it just allows that oxygen. It allows the conversation to breathe. And you don't have to be thinking, what will I say? Because they're going to do some of the talking. Tell me about that. Tennis match, the ball, the ball is in their court then. So open questions. The other side of open questions, of course, is the listening piece. And uh, I referred to that before in my in my previous webinar. I'm, I'm going to remind us about that in a moment, um, about the levels of listening and how effective that is. But before I just go into that, I just want to talk about that listening space, if you like. The, the number one commodity in the world today, it seems to me, is our attention. Everybody is vying for our attention. Every device, every computer, every app, every GPS, every everything, everywhere you go. It's just ding, dong, ding, everywhere, but putting in their notifications. And, and it is becoming more and more difficult to focus on a particular item, subject, or person. And obviously that is a huge detriment to our society, but it's not going away anytime soon. So somebody who sits in front of you and gives you their undivided attention is a very rare, it's a very rare commodity and a very precious uh, bird indeed. So if you can be that person where you can sit in front of somebody as they are talking and connect with them and listen to what they have to say, you are adding a huge amount of impact with that person. You are creating a huge impact with that person and that person will really remember you. If you think of somebody who does that for you in your life, you know how impact, impactful that is and how difficult it is. For, you know, this, you know, how many of us have played Wordle today? So those kind of, every time you think, oh, what will I do now, I'll have a quick Wordle or I'll quickly check my X, Y, or Z. And how many platforms do we need to check? So that notion of putting all that clutter aside and just connecting with somebody, listening and asking questions and hearing their response to the questions, that is becoming a very rare, and as I say, precious space indeed. So there's a really important, I would put a really important emphasis on, on all of that. So attention and focus are king. So I mentioned listening. And, you know, uh, we, I have covered this before, I covered this before in, in a previous webinar, but I am just going to go through it again. So uh, people would uh, agree, it's been posited by many people, Stephen Covey was the first person to posit it, that there's five levels of listening that exist, if you like. Number one is ignoring, and that's you not listening at all. Uh, and that's useful if you're in a public library or you're in a cafe and, you, you know, you're trying to work on something and you can just block everything out. So it's not that it's negative. It's just not necessarily appropriate for everything. It's appropriate for some things. Level number two would be pretending to listen. And that's, you know, my poor unfortunate husband would get that sometimes. And, you know, great for if you've got toddlers or kids around and, you, you know, you can be working with yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I'd love to see that. Yeah, absolutely, and you're doing your own thing. That's pretending. So you're, it's useful. You're checking in. You know that they're safe and they're happy and that you're, they don't necessarily know that you're not 100% connected with them. Um, but it's not a very high level of listening. It's not that effective. But, you know, sometimes it works. Level three would be selective listening. And I think this is where a lot of us spend a lot of time. <laughs> and selective listening will be yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening, but just for the gap in order for me to get in what I actually want to say next and what I've been thinking about saying. Or I'm listening, but I'm only listening for the moment that you say something that I agree with, and then I'm going to come in and say, well, yes, that's what I said, and I, I was going to say that first, or I already said that. So, you know, again, it's not very positive. It's not a very, you know, kind of progressive, positive space. It can be useful if you're working with, you know, we'll say students, for example, and you, you want to see, are they, you know, do they have that piece of information or do they have the, are they on the right track for something maybe that you might have taught them, that kind of thing. So again, there's a space for it. We get into levels four and five, which are much more uh, fruitful grounds. So level four listening, we would, we, would talk, we would describe as attentive listening. And that is you are listening and you are connecting. 
And not only are you listening and connecting, but you're also noticing. You're noticing what you see. You're listening with your eyes as well. So what do I mean by that? So you're noticing the body language. You're noticing how the person is standing. Do they feel comfortable? Uh, are they making eye contact with you? And, you know, you'd be able to pick up on, on certain things like, you know, if someone says to you, um, yeah, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy enough with that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you're going to see, you, you're listening to that and you're going, okay, well, that's that's good to hear. I'm glad to hear you're happy with that. Um, I can't help noticing that you seem a little unsure. Okay, so you're in a whole other world there and then you're offering your the oxygen in the conversation there. The person has, no, you've noticed that that person's unsure and that's going to open up a whole new avenue of dialogue there. So don't be, you know, don't be afraid to embrace what you see with your, what you hear with your eyes, shall we say. So that's attentive listening. The final level of listening, level five, is empathetic listening. And that's the listening that we do with the really strong relationships in our life and, you know, with our partners and our, our loved ones and not just our loved ones, but at a really high effect of the people that we work with. So that is you're, you're, you're listening to what the person says. You're observing how the person is presenting and how they are, you know, you're listening with your eyes, as I said, but you're also, you know, you're putting yourself into the flora and fauna of their world, if you like, and you're, you're, you're stepping in and imagining what that it must feel like for that person. So it's a very high level, you know, it's not something we can't go around all day listening at level five, God would be exhausted by, by lunchtime but it can be, and it is a really effective space to be able to step into and step out of when necessary. So it's a huge way to you know, build trust with somebody and you know, to, to understand and to have like really meaningful dialogue with somebody else. And again, the focus, and it's right back to the first thing I said, the focus is on the other person. It's not on you all the time. And that can be a really strong, impactful way of that other person opening up to you and sharing what's on their mind. And there's an awful lot on people's minds all the time that we only see, you know, the tip of the iceberg, it's 10% of what you're getting. So it's not that you want to be the world's therapist, but if you want to connect with somebody and if you need to connect with somebody and have a meaningful interaction with them, then you do have to pay attention to these areas. Not necessarily all the time, but to, 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 to forge that connection, you're gonna to have to take that on board. Okay, so that's listening. And I, I mentioned there building trust. And building trust is a really important part of, you know, communicating with impact. And I'm going to actually share my screen with you now. Just give me a moment, because there is something I want to share with you. I want to share something called the uh, trust equation. So people will talk about trust being consisting of four distinct elements. So I hope you can see that there. So we talk about uh, the four elements of trust and of ensuring you have trust with somebody. And they are, the first one's credibility. And your credibility is your piece of paper from your college, your qualifications, your what you, what you say that you can do, uh, what you continue, you know, how, where you come from. If you work for a very distinguished firm, that's, that's credible in itself because there's a very, it's difficult to get into these places. So if they've taken you, you must be good at what you do. Um, your credibility, funnily enough, is the easiest thing to, to, to get hold of. You know, that's, that's what you do and it's easy to prove. Um, the reliability is speaks for itself that's your actions you know do you turn up do you do what you you said you do and do you meet those deadlines do you do it when you said you'll do it so the credibility and the reliability are two of the easiest ones to maintain to to acquire and maintain you just keep your head down get your job done and do it on time you've got those in the bag the more difficult ones then are later down intimacy so what do I mean by intimacy? I'm not saying, you, you know, that you open your heart to every single person you speak to. That would be totally inappropriate. But intimacy is made up of empathy. So how you feel about how you show your feelings and your empathy towards other people and how you share that. 
and your transparency. How much of yourself do you give? So if you think back to my story that I told you, um, so you can see there were times in that, like everybody's life, that were difficult for me. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I was transparent in some of those details, but obviously you didn't hear all of them. There's way more that I didn't choose to share because I put parameters around it. But there's enough there for you to find, for, you know, I, I'm trying to be, you know, open with you and to be honest about, you know, the things that have happened in my life to, to bring me along there, because that's, they're the things that make me human. So I'm, I'm being a little bit vulnerable there. So that kind of human transparent part shows that I am prepared to open myself a little bit. And I'm hoping that that will make you trust me a little bit more. So there your top line there, your credibility, reliability and intimacy. That's all what you're, that's all. I never know if it's just the denominator or the nominator, but anyway, you guys are know more about mathematical things than I do. But anyway, they're on the top and on the bottom, I think is the denominator, um, is self-orientation. So what does that mean, that self-orientation? In a nutshell, that means your agenda. What's, what's your agenda in this? So if I ask you for a conversation and really I just want to give you a dressing down for something that happened, and then that's my agenda. And that's, that's all this conversation is about. So the more I play that and the more I bring in that agenda, if you like, that self-orientation, the less you're going to be vested in the conversation with me and the less you're going to trust me. So your challenge in this is to lower your self-orientation as much as you can. Now, we're all human, and obviously we have a reason to communicate with people. But if, you've got, if you can, there's a tension there between you know, my agenda, which clearly drives me, and your agenda, which clearly drives you. <laughs> so <clears throat> how can I Im improve my trust, build my trust with you? It's to lower my self-orientation and sit with yours a little bit more. That is, it, it's all, it's, it's all the same message, really, isn't it? And which is focus more on, on the other person in order to impact more. And it will work for you. So that's the trust equation. Credibility, reliability, and intimacy over self-orientation. And there's a great book, which I freely confess I haven't read, but it's one of those books where the title uh, is, you can judge a book by the title. And uh, the title of the book is, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. It's by David, by uh, Marshall Goldsmith is the name of the man who wrote it. And I just think that is a really useful little thing to think about. So what got you here is your, you, the hard work that you've done, your academic qualifications, all those exams you passed, all those projects that you, you, you pulled out of the bag and you stayed up all night on all those tricky things that you've done in your life. That's what's got you here. It won't get you there. If you want to be impactful with people on a more kind of psychological basis, if you like, and, and really meet up with, with other people and become, you know, an inspirational figure, if you like. I mean, that's quite extreme. It, you know, it doesn't have to be. It's not all about being an inspirational figure, but just to be somebody that people can connect to and want to connect with, that is much more difficult. That's back to the Silicon Valley wanting, you know, needing communication skills in order to sell their tech and all of that. So that's where it becomes more finessed. And, you know, that's where these things like listening and being on the other person's agenda, connecting with the person, they are just things that you can train yourself to do. The way you can train yourself to put down your wordle and get on with what you actually have to do. So that's the trust equation. I think that's really useful. Um, I, I bear that in mind. I, I use that in lots of different trainings that I'm involved with. And I find that works, you know, extremely well. So I would bear that in mind. Um, okay, so the next thing that I am going to uh, talk about is so now I'm, I'm leaning now more towards, and, and this is kind of coming towards the end of what I have to say, and I'm hoping we can open up, you know, a dialogue around this, is, um, you know, the bigger picture, like what I call the words, the music, and the dance, right? Again, you know, we think back to my, my background in, in acting. So if we talk about the words, when you're going in to talk to somebody, and you're thinking about, 
you know, you should be thinking about what register am I going to use here? What, what kind of vocabulary will I be using? Is this formal? Is it informal? You're not going to be approaching every conversation or interaction in the same vein, you know, it's going to turn up the way I turn up with my family and friends. These things are decided. And you need to make decisions about that. So, you know, are, are you allowing are you allowing fillers to really muddy your message and muddy what you say, like a sort of kind of uh, or the big one now that that drives me crazy is I suppose. Listen up for that word. It's a, like a virus in Irish business at the moment. Well, I suppose, you know, we look at the figures from Q4 and I suppose we just thought that maybe, I, I don't know, I suppose we might be in a more positive. We might have thought, I suppose, that we would have been in a more positive situation. It's just a death note. I mean, it's okay to use it once or twice, but what happens is these little ticks, vocal verbal ticks come in and they invade our, our vocabulary and our dialogue and they just muddy everything down and they make it, they really diffuse the message that you're trying to give across. So the first thing like any of this is any, like anything in your life is to be aware that you, if you're using any of these things, I find the phone really, really useful. If I'm going into something or I need to, you know, something is important, some kind of communication, I will often just record like the first two minutes. How am I going to say this? Or how am I going to open this? And I'll record myself and just listen back. And I'm just on the watch for things like that. Because what it does is it says to me that I'm not 100% certain about this and I'm feeling awkward about it or I can't think of what I want to say and therefore these things start to come in and everything gets really muddy and claggy and it's just it just brings everything down. So do you have any of that that you can eliminate? That would be a really key message for me. The other thing around vocabulary is you know, what are you saying? Uh, what are you actually saying to somebody? Say you need to have a, a, to talk to somebody about something significant. You know, another big one that people use is the word just. So you know, I just want to have a quick chat about something. So if I say, if I hear that, I just want to have a quick chat. To me, that says, this is not significant. It's not important. It's just a quick chat. Whereas should you be saying, I, I need to have an important conversation or I need to have a conversation that I think is important. It's much more meaningful. It's clear. The lines are clear and it just comes across better to the other person. So watch your vocabulary. Watch those little fillers. Can you eliminate them? Can you use your open questions? Do you need more assertive language? This is important to me and I need this to be done. I'd like to talk about how this could be done by then. You know, you can say a strong message with a, a soft tone. So question yourself on that. Um, speaking of tone, is your tone appropriate? You know, tone is really important now in this age. Is, is it monotone is very difficult to listen to. Can you modulate your speech? Using adjectives is a great way to say, we had a fantastic meeting the other day, or I really loved that. Um, are you, when you, when you join some group or person or even breakout room, what are you bringing to that? You're either adding to the tone and the energy there, or you're taking away from it. So that's your decision before you join. So make the, your decision about that. Am I adding something positive or is it negative? And if I'm feeling bad, I'm, you know, let me get into this more positive frame before I join. That all affects your tone. The other thing is around inflection and we're all going up. And it's really annoying for those older people in the generation. I know it's common for younger generations. Watch that upward inflection. It's traditionally used for asking questions. So if you're constantly going up all the time, it tells me two things. It tells me that they're not certain of what they're saying because it sounds like a question. And also they're not finished. Are they finished? I might have finished. I might have more to say. You're not going to know until I come up and down. So try to end with your downward inflection. We had a really good meeting and we're going to do this. And boom, it just makes you sound so much more on top of your message. So look, I've talked a lot. The last thing I'm going to say is, you know, what can we learn from the theatre? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a concept that uh, was devised in the theatre by a woman called Patsy Rodenberg. So Patsy Rodenberg was the first vocal uh, coach or, the, you know, the vocal, I um, can't think of the word, she, 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 she initiated the vocal department in the National Theatre in London. And she, she worked in the Royal Shakespeare Company for a very long time, and she teaches in schools all over the world. So Patsy Rodenberg has brought something really interesting and useful to the table. She talks about the three circles. 
So the first circle for Patsy Rodenberg is a very introverted um, situation where you're receiving energy, but you're not giving it out. Your, your body kind of caves in, your spine collapses, your shoulders are round, your breath is shallow, and that's where you get your vocal fry, your voice is in the back of your throat, and it sits there, very difficult to break out, or very difficult to listen to. A lot of us are in that, in the world that we're in now with these this kind of virtual world. Again, it can be useful sometimes for intimate conversations and for, you know, more very small little dialogue. It's not without its merits. The third circle is the opposite of that. It's up and out and it's, you know, chest out, you're over uh, expansive, you're dealing with a big group of people, it's quite forced, it's maybe disconnected, you know, you're giving out energy, but you're not taking it in. Your breath can be sharp, sharp and jagged and, you know, noisy intakes, your voice can be vulnerable and it can be, you know, you can damage your voice in that. So look, just like our Goldilocks, the sweet spot is in the second circle. So the second circle, you're sending out energy and you're receiving it. Your posture is aligned. Your shoulders are up and out. I mean, you know, they're, they're relaxed. They're, you're in neutral. You can be standing in neutral or sitting in neutral. Your breath is nice and, gen and deep and it's supporting your voice and you are connected to everything you need to be. Your jaw is loose and you are ready to go. You're what I would call an armed neutrality. Neutral, but ready. So second circle is what we can learn from the theater and we can bring into our interactions. So that's really what, where, that's really everything that I have. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with that, uh, you know, first circle, not enough, third circle, too much, second circle, just right. So I'm gonna hand you back now to Dee and I'm really looking forward to hearing some thoughts, questions, maybe interaction from the audience. So Dee. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I have a long list of to do's after that, I can tell you. I'm checking my screen as we speak. And um, I love I love some of those uh, concepts that you talked about and took so much away. So look, thank you so much. Um, you'd be glad to hear. I'm just going to go into this chat here for a second. So we have the accountant, uh, the accountants, I should say, amongst us. Um, so Philip here, numerator is over the denominator. So I don't know whether ah. I pronounced that correctly, but thank you for that, Philip. So that's cleared that one up for us. <laughs> <laughs> the denominator. Yeah, the denominator. So um look, there's a there's a question, there's a couple of questions come in, and I'll just yeah. kick off with those first of all. So the first person has said um when presenting on teams, it can be very difficult to see the other members on the call. So any suggestions around that? So a very kind of practical question there. Yeah, well, I suppose uh, there I suppose uh, I, I kick off straight away with that. I mean, obviously your grid is is very useful with that. Um, one of the things that people find useful is to just get rid of their own image. Um, I personally, if I'm talking to a group of people, if it's more than, you know, I think you're allowed about 12 or something on screen. I personally use the arrow to, to flick along and to see to sort of feel, you know, am I losing the room or are people still with me? And, you know, people don't know that I'm doing that, but, you know, it gives me a very good indication of how this is sitting with other people. And I would always try to make it interactive. So I would always say at the beginning, I try to say at the beginning, look, I, you know, really welcome your thoughts. I'm going to ask you questions in and out, you know, during this. And so, you know, you can, I mean, the beauty of this world, of course, is the name is written there. So you can sort of say, things like, um, you know, Mary, what did you think of that? Or, you know, John, um, uh, what, what thoughts are suited with you when, you when you hear what I just said there? So, you know, keep an eye on them. Don't be afraid to, to reach out and, you know, ask people specific questions, use their name. Uh, generally speaking, people will respond. Great. Thanks for that. So the next question is, I, I find I am sometimes too empathetic and probably engage in level five too often. And um, so too focused on the other person's reactions and feelings when I'm trying to communicate. So it's definitely exhausting. So it's any tips to get away from that, because it's definitely a good thing for others. So maybe not yeah. so good for yourself, as you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a really good point to make. And, you know, I, I, I think I said it during during the webinar there around boundaries. 
And it's really important for us all to have boundaries around you know, what we're prepared to give of ourselves and what we're not prepared to give. So, you know, if you're working in an organization, for example, you may have an EAP program. If somebody is, you know, somebody comes to you and they're, you know, full of concerns or they're opening up a little bit, you're absolutely, you know, you're listening and you're, you know, you're, you're empathizing with the person. But there comes a point in the conversation where, you know, it might be useful for you to say, look, you're obviously something like, you're obviously going through lots of really difficult things at the moment. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm really not the best person to help you with that. I think it'd be really useful for you if you contacted the, whatever, the EAP or whatever. Um, if it's more one-to-one, -one, then, you know, it, it can be more difficult. If the other person is sort of dumping on you all the time, then Again, you're, you're, the onus is to protect yourself with those boundaries. So, you know, it could be appropriate to maybe, sounds harsh, but to not so much limit contact, but to allow yourself a certain amount of contact with that person, but then to remember your own boundaries around that. If you feel that you can't, you haven't impacted enough, you haven't been able to get the message across that you're, you can't help them as much as they need help, then you owe it to yourself to pull back a little bit. You know, you can listen and, and empathize, but then there comes a point where you say, look, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm not sure what I can say to help you. You know, and again, that's a kind of assertive piece around that as well. You, you're protecting what, I, what your needs and requirements are. I can't, you know, and really I, I can't listen to this all the time. So you're there for them, but you're not stepping in as some kind of therapist when you, you don't have those qualifications. Yeah, that's very, very good response because um, it's very easy to step into that space when someone is being vulnerable with you. So that's really wise words there. So thank you for that. Um, so the next question is great presentation, really useful. Um, my question is, should you st stand or sit when presenting? Is standing better? Standing is always better, <laughs> always better. Now, that's one of the things that has hampered us over the last two years is we're very much rooted to this, you know, kind of very static new environment. But standing is so much better because it gives you posture. If you think of that second circle, I had to rush through a little bit at the end because I knew I was running out of time. But that second circle space is a really valuable kind of relaxing space to be in. And if you can stand with your two feet firmly on the ground, and I don't know if you have noticed, but I find in particular women tend to wrap their legs around, you know, when they're standing. What they're saying is, I feel really uncomfortable in front of you. And, and boy, is that obvious. So standing allows you to align it. it you know, your, your rhythms are better. The body is a perfectly symmetrical unit. You know, you've got those two legs, two feet, you've two knees, two hips, two shoulders and your head on top. And if you can stand and, you know, measure the weight equally there, it allows your rib cage to be in place. That in itself allows your breathing to go through, flow through your body. That supports your voice. Like it just, it's like a link in a chain. Everything just works together. Plus the standing part of it, it gives, it's more energized. It's more, you know, it, it will just lift everything off. You, once you start sitting, you're, you're liable to get into that first circle scenario and everything comes down a little bit and then your voice goes down. It's so much more important to get out of first circle when you're on screen. It's easier to be in second circle when you're standing because even the, the, the physicality of standing and moving, that in itself feeds the, the energy and your, your heart and your breath, everything is working perfectly. So it feeds itself, you know? So the thing, the, doing the action makes the action better. <laughs> so yes, it's Love it. Great. So we all have to adopt now to our, our desks and find a space where we can actually stand up when we're presenting because it is definitely, it definitely feels better when you're standing up oh, and, sure. and it's easier, definitely. Um, so we have another question here as well around tackling the nerves. And I think you did kind of allude to it there slightly, but tackling nerves when you're going into a, a tricky conversation or mm. a tricky presentation, is there anything practically that you can do to, to help you with that? It's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it never goes away. And, you know, I, I would encourage you to think about, again, think about other people. So think about other jobs. Think about being an actor. 
you know, if you're, if you're doing a new play and it's opening night in the Abbey and, you know, you've got like 500 people out there, including all the press and everyone, their job is to judge you. <laughs> um, and, and you've got to go out there and do that. And, and sometimes in a very vulnerable role or whatever. How do people do that? How do people fly an airplane? when they've got, you know, the lives of 500 people. How do people do open heart surgery when the person, it's literally a, a matter of life and death? The answer to that is that everybody finds a way to get to master that, master those nerves that come about your every day-to-day -day job, the actions that you have to do in your day-to-day -day job. So maybe for some people that's meditation, maybe it's going for a walk, maybe it's planning, I mean, planning is everything as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that it's, it's sitting down beforehand. Like, I think people spend an awful lot of energy going, oh my God, I'm so nervous about this. I'm so nervous. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so nervous. Instead of actually sitting down going, okay, how can I tackle this? How can I make sure that I am so well prepared that I, there's nothing to be nervous about actually because I know what I'm doing. And I, I would say with presentations, Presentations are something that we're all going to be doing and we all do, most of us do at some stage in our life. So much so that they've revitalized the curriculum in secondary schools to include presentations from TY, from third year actually, because people in industry were saying, your young people are coming out of school and college and they don't know how to do presentations. So presentations generally are on something that you know something about, right? So you have that, knowledge and remember my trustworthy the the trust equation that's your credibility they're asking you to present because you know this stuff so your focus on the presentation should be the links between one thing and the next the how am i going to start this how am i going to maybe get them to become involved how am i going to end it not with the stuff itself because you got that that's what you that's why you've been asked to do it. So you, you're going to be sitting down, you're going to be preparing what is it that I need to do in order to get myself over this sickening nerves that I have. First of all, it's all that breathing and whatever else you require. But secondly, it's I'm going to be so prepared that there's no room for nerves because I know where I'm going and the links there that I that are bringing me from one place to the next are going to be copper fastened by me. If I have to do it 10 times in a row, I'll do it. And that's what actors do in rehearsals. So that's another tip we can learn from the theater. That's brilliant. Love that. I've got to be doing that myself now, Jen. Um, and then just finally, we've only got time for one more question. So um, the questions just come in here. Um, what can you do if you're not getting support in the training aspects of this? So if you if you come on to this um, session today and you go, look, I actually need some training here. I, I can do as much as you know I can, but there's something that I'm really looking for, maybe from an expert like yourself. So what can you actually do to sort of bring you on to move the dial a little bit in this area? Yeah, well, I mean, first thing I would do is if you're working, if you're working uh, as a staff member in an organization, you know, go get onto the, the learning and development, the L&D team, they will have lots of uh, available options for you. Uh, if you're freelance and you're working from home, there's any number of books that you can read, you can go online, listen to some TED Talks, they're a fantastic source. Um, there's, uh, there, there, there's lots of, you know, the little kind of you know, these little videos are only five minutes long. There's, um, you know, there's any, any number of like management books or how can I improve my whatever. And of course you can engage a professional, you know, you can go to a coach, contact me if you want. There's lots of people like me out there and, and get a get a one-to-one -one and, and, you know, invest in yourself. You know, you are your product nowadays, now more than ever. So invest in yourself. People spend 100 euro now on, on, a, on a jumper or something. So why not spend 100 euro on, on maximizing your own impact? Yeah, really good idea. Absolutely. It's, it's almost even reframing that and saying this is something that I need to be doing for myself, for my own development. Yeah, yeah, very simply put and very, very clever. Well, it looks like we're right up at the top of the hour. Um, so, Jennifer, thank you so much again for coming along today. Um, I'm sure we'll get you back for another session because this is a broad subject, communication with impact, you know, those difficult conversations, all that good stuff. Um, I think there's going to be some learnings as we as we now re-enter the kind of the workspaces of old. Um, and we're going to, this will all throw up new challenges for us. So um, I'm sure we'll get you back again for, for part three. Um, but in the meantime, if uh, people that are on the call here today are not aware about... Um, 
the services with Thrive um, and of course with CA support, but firstly with Thrive, that is your wellbeing hub here at the Institute. So um, please uh, do get in contact if anything has resonated here with you today. If you're looking for some coaching, if you're looking for wellbeing advice um, or anything related to that, please do get in, in touch with us. Um, and CA support, of course, is the financial assistance, um, the old benevolent fund, as some people may remember it as. Um, and please do get in touch for, for that service as well. So um, all remains for me to say, Jen, is again, thank you so much. Thanks to Chris behind the scenes and the CPD team as well for helping us get this um, put on today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. So keep an eye on the Thrive Wellbeing Hub. There's a live calendar there with all of the next events um, and all you have to do is register for free. So look forward to seeing you again. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.